Peace has its victories as well as war, and this was one of the victories of the human spirit today. President Kennedy's statement commemorated astronaut Gordon Cooper's flight in the final Mercury spacecraft, Faith 7. It was a thoughtful tribute, marking the successful completion of our country's first manned space program. Astronaut Cooper's splashdown was on May 16, 1963. Six years later, the mighty Apollo 11 space vehicle would begin its rollout to Pad A, Launch Complex 39, at the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. On board at launch in a matter of weeks would be spacecraft commander Neil Armstrong, lunar module pilot Buzz Aldrin, and command module pilot Mike Collins three men destined to be the first known living beings to journey from one world, our good Earth, in order to land two of them on another world in space. On the eve of this history-making mission, a group of government and industry manned spaceflight executives gathered together to witness the impending launch. This film is the story of the manned spaceflight executive team and the six years and two months between the last Mercury splashdown and the launch of the first manned lunar landing mission. This team served in effect as the board of directors of the manned spaceflight program. Mercury Summary Conference was held in Houston in mid-1963. The lonely solo space flights by Mercury astronauts, two of them suborbital and four in Earth orbit, were a propitious beginning. They proved that man could survive and operate effectively in space in missions up to 34 hours in duration. Mercury laid a sound foundation for the technology of manned space flight. But the goal of the decade was to land the man on the moon and return him safely. This was the Apollo program, an immensely greater technological challenge. Responsible for meeting this challenge, George Miller, NASA's director of manned space flight since 1963, realized that the successful execution of such a vast, history-making undertaking as Apollo required the most efficient coordination of the best the nation could offer in scientific, engineering, manufacturing, and management skills. A vast government industry team was being built. At its peak, it would consist of more than 100,000 engineers in a total of 350,000 men and women and 20,000 contractors. But this huge nationwide team itself needed a team to steer it to call the plays a managerial nucleus of government and industrial quarterbacks. By October 1963, Dr. Miller had called together part of this varsity team to be known as the Apollo Executives Group, made up of the directors of NASA's manned space flight centers and the senior executives of the major Apollo contractors, such as Gene McNeely of AT&T, Jack Parker of GE, Jack Horner of United Aircraft, GM's J.A. Anderson, and Bellcom's John Hornbeck. He also formed a Gemini executives group with men like Dan Houghton of Lockheed Aircraft, Bill Zish of Aerojet, and Major General Ben Funk of the Air Force. The third group was an operations executives group with leaders like Lieutenant General Lee Davis of DOD, Les Graffis of Bendix, and Ed Buckley of OTDA. The chief executives of 16 Apollo contractors attended the first meetings in October 1963. They were given a general orientation on the Apollo program, on the spacecraft, flight operations, launch and control centers, and the launch vehicles. 
Saturn I, which would place unmanned boilerplate test models of the command and service modules into Earth orbit. Saturn 1B, which would launch unmanned and then manned Apollo spacecraft into Earth orbit. And finally, Saturn 5, whose three stages would rocket men to the moon. Over the next three meetings, the Apollo executives visited NASA centers and contractors plants around the nation. In December, the group visited with Kurt Debus at the Kennedy Space Center, where preparations were underway for Gemini flights, still more than a year away, and where construction had begun at Merritt Island on the Apollo assembly, checkout, and launch facilities. When completed, the vehicle assembly building would be the largest building in the world. At the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, Werner von Braun showed the giant captive test firing stands which were being readied. As they were also at the Mississippi Test Facility near New Orleans. At Houston, Bob Gilruth displayed the Manned Spacecraft Center where construction had begun in 1962. It was almost ready for full occupancy. In January 1964, the Apollo executives toured West Coast contractors, where Lee Atwood's Rocketdyne directors briefed them on engines. They visited Santa Susana and Edwards Air Force Base. On the same California trip, they inspected the impressive shops of North American aviation at Downey. And at Seal Beach, part of this nation's multi-billion dollar investment in space technology. Don Douglas showed Douglas Aircraft's new Huntington Beach and old Santa Monica facilities. Each company presented management briefings, including status reports and manpower forecasts. In March 1964, the Apollo executives toured contractor centers in the Northeast. Clint Toll showed them Grumman Aircraft, birthplace of the lunar module. And Al Williams was host at the IBM Space Guidance Center. Bill Gwynn described the United Aircraft fuel cell system. And Charlie Town showed the MIT Instrumentation Lab. The agenda of the March and June meetings in 1964 covered major topics of importance at the time. How to ensure adequate reliability for manned use of spaceflight components. How to improve launch date predictions. What is the acceptable level of crew safety? How best to control changes in design and scope? How to educate and inform the public about the benefits of the manned spaceflight program? How best to use cost incentives with cost plus an incentive fee replacing fixed fee contracts? The executives agreed on contracting procedures and helped institute a system of subsystem or work package managers. The necessity of keeping Congress well informed on the space program was recognized early in the executive meetings and regular congressional critique sessions were held by Bob Freitag. Helped by the regular exchange of views and cooperation between industry and government executives, the space program progressed well. The Apollo, Gemini, and operations executive groups proved to be an invaluable management tool. For example, when it became obvious that Gemini manned flights would be delayed until 1965, the Gemini executives, especially Gene Root and Bill Bergen, were able to suggest to Dr. Miller ways to reduce the time between planned launch centers to two-month intervals. This meant that beginning with the first launch, Gemini 3 on March 23, 1965, 
The complete Gemini program of 10 manned flights would be performed in less than two years. years of Gemini and Apollo, the course of true spaceflight did not always run smooth. caller transporter. Failures threaten the cost and schedule parameters of the manned space program. But the impact of such technical setbacks was lessened by inter-contractor cooperation, a willingness on the part of each to share its advanced technology with the others. System failures were reviewed, and the causes attacked at all manned spaceflight executive meetings. In one case, for example, the rupture of a titanium pressure vessel resulted in the emergency assignment by several companies of about 25 specialists who, working together, got to the root of the problem. Someone used pure titanium to weld the tank instead of an alloy. An example of how the Gemini executives helped to avoid program delays by taking prompt, decisive action following a system failure is the rescheduling of Gemini 6 after the launch of the first Atlas Agena target vehicle. The Agena malfunctioned after liftoff and failed to achieve orbit. Analysis indicated that a hard start or backfire ruptured the hypergolic propellant tanks. To offset the threatened program delay, Walter Burke of the McDonnell Company, working with Chuck Matthews and Bill Schneider, suggested de-erecting Gemini 6 and erecting Gemini 7 in its place. Six weeks after the Agena failure, Gemini 7 was launched. Within 24 hours, Gemini 6 was again erected. Eight days later, it was once again ready for launch. The second launch attempt failed due to premature engine shutdown. On December 15, 1965, the third launch attempt for Gemini 6 was successful. In it, astronauts Shira and Stafford achieved the first rendezvous with another vehicle in space when they approached to within one foot of Gemini 7. Astronauts Borman and Lovell in Gemini 7 went on to establish a record for manned spaceflight duration. They were in orbit for 14 days. Another unexpected crisis occurred on the next mission, Gemini 8. The target vehicle was launched flawlessly. Ninety minutes later, astronauts Armstrong and Scott also were placed in orbit in Gemini 8. Spacecraft Commander Armstrong maneuvered his spacecraft to a rendezvous with Agena. Then accomplished the first docking of two vehicles in space. For about 30 minutes, Armstrong put the dock vehicles through various maneuvers, until suddenly the gemini agena combination began to roll, slowly at first, then faster. Calmly and methodically, Armstrong searched for the cause of the trouble, tried shutting down Agena systems, then undocked the two vehicles. 
But the spin continued. Gemini reached a roll rate of one revolution per second, close to the limit of human tolerance. A short circuit had caused one of the thrusters to stick in the on position. Armstrong was able to override this by using his re-entry control system thrusters. But the reduced supply of re-entry fuel led to orders from the ground to terminate the mission by re-entering and landing in a contingency area in the Pacific. Contingency provisions worked out by the organizations headed up by the operations executive group proved up to the challenge. DOD recovery forces were deployed to the contingency area. Three hours after splashdown, the USS Mason had the crew and spacecraft safely on board. Operation executives' efficiency was further exemplified by actions such as a trip to Antigua, set up by Major General Vince Houston to check out the tracking network. The next Gemini mission was another mixture of problems and ultimate success. A major delay resulted when the Agena's Atlas booster failed during launch on May 17, 1966. Subsequently, a substitute target vehicle, the augmented target docking adapter, was launched into orbit. When the crew of Gemini 9A attained rendezvous, they found that the adapter shroud had not fully separated. Astronaut Stafford dubbed the vehicle an angry alligator and performed two more rendezvous maneuvers with it. In 1965 and 1966, the 10-man Gemini flights proved the feasibility of several phases of a lunar mission, including a total of 12 hours, 22 minutes of astronaut extravehicular activity in space. In the meantime, the Apollo Executives Group continued to serve as an instrument for the top management planning. In October 1965, after a tour of Chrysler with Tom Morrow, and Boeing with Bill Allen at Michoude, and a visit to the Mississippi Test Facility, discussions were held for the first time on manned spaceflight plans for projects to follow the Apollo moon landing. At the next meeting in November at Phoenix, the general theme concerned the ideas and concepts for post-Apollo projects. After each member stated his views, they were summarized as follows. The manned spaceflight program should explore and utilize world resources for the benefit of mankind, define and develop operational capabilities for the next generation of space vehicles beyond the Saturn Apollo systems, expand man's knowledge of the near-Earth and lunar environments, increase the security of the United States through space operations, and develop a capability to provide a livable, usable environment for man to operate efficiently in space for one year. Planning and discussion for post-Apollo lunar landing programs were to intensify over the next several meetings. For the Apollo program offers an interesting example of a financing and management puzzle. Before a single manned Apollo mission was launched, the program itself began to go out of business. Peak expenditures had fallen off drastically by the very nature of the hardware before the flights began, causing a sort of fiscal schizophrenia on the part of finance officers. Following are representative excerpts from a typical meeting. In a sense, space provides a new frontier, and our space vehicles are the first means of transportation by which this new frontier can be explored. If we don't take positive action, we're indeed going to be in a position where we're losing this manpower. Now, one of the most impressive things to me is that uh, I think that uh, in this program a, a very strong team has been developed. I think in uh, 20 years we are going to be uh, moving to the planets. We have an option to go forward. We have not committed the nation to an Apollo applications program. Apollo executive meetings in May 1966 at the Cape 
and in August in Washington were primarily devoted to costs and funding. Cost increases due to unavoidable changes required new efforts at cost controls. Also, the status of fabrication and testing of Apollo hardware was such that the program had reached and passed its peak costs. This called for concentrated joint efforts at cost reduction. Discussion centered on progress in reducing program costs. U.S. manned spaceflight activities were in high gear. The Saturn I program had been an unprecedented success story. Saturn 1B flights were well underway, and Saturn V was rapidly approaching the flight test phase. The highly successful Gemini program ended with the final flight of Gemini 12 in November. On January 27, 1967, a joint meeting of Gemini and Apollo executives was held in Washington, one of several efforts to pass on to the Apollo program the benefits of the knowledge and experience gained in Gemini by men like Jim McDonnell, Mr. Mack, member of both the Gemini and Apollo teams. Quite a few key men participated in both programs, NASA's Jim Elms, for example. While the joint meeting was underway, not far away, President Johnson was signing the recently negotiated space treaty, whereby the United States and over 90 other nations agree that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is the province of all mankind, not subject to claims of national sovereignty. Suddenly, at the Cape, tragedy struck. The news stunned the nation. Fire in the spacecraft during a launch pad exercise by the crew of Apollo 204 took their lives. Astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee died in the command module. After the first shock, Apollo and operations executives helped launch an immediate coordinated government industry investigation. The tragedy delayed the first manned Apollo mission more than one full year. At subsequent meetings, the Apollo Executives Group carefully received the findings of the Apollo 204 Review Board and expedited the many changes, combustible material substitutions, and improvements being made in the spacecraft. The space suit. cabin atmosphere, and launch pad escape methods. The program recovered, began to roll again. As confidence was restored, momentum again accelerated. Plans continued for missions of lunar exploration, orbital workshops, and other Apollo applications program requirements. executives meeting of November 30th, 1967, Lieutenant General Sam Phillips was able to report the complete success of SA-501, the unmanned Apollo 4 flight of November 9th. It was the first launch from Complex 39, the first Saturn V launch, the first restart flight of the third stage S-4B, the first flight of a lunar module boilerplate, first re-entry test of the command module at the lunar return velocity of 25,000 miles per hour. SA-501 was the first all-up test, 
the most crucial single flight in the program. The 1967 November meeting was also devoted to discussions of systems management. The Apollo executives ultimately compiled 14 volumes on the subject. As the date for the first manned Apollo flight drew near, training for the lunar missions intensified. Some delay was threatened by the failure of a research model of the lunar landing training vehicle. Piloted by astronaut Armstrong, who coolly ejected just 200 feet up, the vehicle careened and crashed. The first manned flight, Apollo 7, by astronauts Cunningham, Isley, and Shira on October 12, 1968, was another encouraging milestone. These were the first television pictures of an Apollo crew in flight. At their meeting of September 27, 1968, the Apollo executives concurred in a lunar orbital flight by Apollo 8, the C Prime mission. Along with the rest of the nation, they were enthralled by man's first journey to the moon and the Christmas Eve greetings from astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. At their 19th meeting, March 19, 1969, the Apollo Executives Group reviewed the successful Earth orbital mission of Apollo 9 and agreed that the program was ready for a second lunar orbital flight. was a perfect dress rehearsal for the moon landing voyage to be made by Apollo 11. Apollo 10 returned data on the moon's varying gravity and on navigational anomalies without which an accurate landing would not be possible. The lunar module called Snoopy, with astronaut Stafford and Cernan, approached to within 10 miles of the surface, reporting back to astronaut Young and Charlie Brown, the command module. The landing next time. In retrospect, the space time years have flown since May 25th, 1961. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Just eight years later, President Nixon could say about the first Apollo lunar landing mission. What could bring home to us more the limitations of the human scale than the hauntingly beautiful picture of our Earth seen from the moon? When the first man stands on the moon next month, every American will stand taller because of what he has done. And the goal was reached on schedule and within the estimated costs. The Gemini, Apollo, and operations executive teams can indeed stand tall for their role in shaping history. On July 16, 1969, at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 
Apollo 11 lifted off to begin the lunar landing mission. Later, the command module with its precious cargo of men, recordings, films, and lunar specimens would splash down in the Pacific. At the post-recovery briefing, George Miller would capture the significance of the mission, its challenge, and its promise for mankind. Let us listen as we view highlights from those eight days, photographed and brought back to us by the three astronauts. I know that my colleagues, <clears throat> Bob Gilruth, Werner von Braun, and Kurt Devis join me in expressing our deep appreciation and great admiration for the work that the teams led by General Phillips, Dr. Lowe, Colonel James, and Admiral Middleton did to make this mission possible and for the execution of the mission by the teams of George Hage, Davy Jones, Chris Kraft, and Rockwell Patron. Perhaps the greatest praise I can give them all is to say that they have proved with the ease that comes of long, hard work, what we all instinctively knew, that man could successfully travel to another planet and return. And because they have proved it, we now stand at what is undoubtedly the greatest decision point in the history of this planet. Four billion years ago, the Earth was formed. 400 million years ago, life moved to the land. Four million years ago, man appeared on the Earth. 100 years ago, the technological revolution that led to this day began. All of these events were important, yet in none of them did man make a conscious decision to follow a path that would change the future of all mankind. We have that opportunity and that challenge today. Forward. Forward. Head. 30 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down, straight shadow. Four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. There remains for mankind the task of deciding the next step. Will we press forward to explore other planets, or will we deny the opportunities of the future? To me, the choice is clear. We must take the next step. Should we hesitate to exploit the first step? Should we withdraw in fear from the next step? Or should we substitute temporary material welfare for spiritual adventure and long-term accomplishment? Then will man fall back from his destiny. The mighty surge of his achievement will be lost and the confines of this planet will destroy it. This is a time for decision. This is a time for rededication to the spirit of our forefathers, a time for all men to move forward together. The organization that brought men to the moon stands ready for the next step. The knowledge possessed by men is sufficient. The resources of this nation are adequate for the task of carrying out this next step. The will of the people of this nation 
and of the world will determine whether mankind will make the great leap to the planets. In this moment of man's greatest achievement, it is timely for us to dedicate ourselves to the unfinished work so nobly begun by three of us, to resolve that this nation, under God, will join with all men in the pursuit of the destiny of mankind, will lead the way to the planets.